This is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day that the Lord has made. Sing it again. This is the day. Oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. Oh, I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in it. This is I want two wings, two wings to bell my feet. I want two wings, two wings to fly away where the world can't do me no harm. Two wings, I want two wings, two wings to bell my face. I want two wings, two wings to bell my feet. I want two wings, two wings to fly away where the world can't do me no harm. Two wings, two wings. Lord, to veil my face. I want two wings, two wings. Lord, to veil my feet. I want two wings, two wings. Lord, to fly away where the world can't do me no harm. Two wings, two wings. One of these old mornings, I know it won't be long. You'll look for me somewhere. But I'll be gone on home with two wings, two wings, Lord, to veil my face. I want two wings, two wings, Lord, to veil my feet. I need two wings, two wings, to fly away where the world can do me no harm. Two wings, two wings, two wings, to veil my face. I need two wings, two wings, Lord, to veil my my feet, I want two wings, two wings, all to fly away where the world can't do me no harm. Meet me, Jesus, meet me in the middle of the air. And if these wings should fail me, I want you to meet me with another pair. Two wings, two wings. 
need two wings to veil my face. I want two wings, two wings, Lord, to veil my feet. I want two wings, two wings to fly away where the world can't do me no harm. Two wings, two wings, two wings to veil my face. Lord, I want two wings, two wings. Just to bear my feet, I need two wings, two wings, Lord, to fly away where the world can't do me no harm. Savior, why don't you hear my humble cry? And while on others thou art calling, I need you to do not pass me by. And I'm calling you to. I like to stay here longer than man's allotted days and watch the fleeting changes of life's uneven ways. But if my Savior calls me to that sweet home on high, I'll live with him forever in glory by and by. Oh, yes, I'll live in glory living. Praise God. It's good to be here together with you again as we prepare to worship Almighty God. Brothers, brothers, Brother Bradley, how you doing? All right. We have assembled together to worship, honor, and praise him because he is worthy. Amen? Amen. We thank all of you here at the building, as well as those of you in our live stream audience for worshiping with us on this fine Sunday morning. It is our prayer that you will be inspired at the hearing of God's word when it's preached this morning, and that it will strengthen you and strengthen your relationship with God as you walk with him in your spiritual journey. Our call to worship scripture this morning is Psalm 24, verses 1 through 5. After which we will have our opening prayer, and then we will be led together in song by our Brother Webb this morning. Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's, and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Would you bow with me in prayer?
our merciful and righteous God. We come together at this time, Father, to worship and honor and praise you, because of course you are worthy. We just ask, Father, that this worship, the things that we say, the things that we do will be seasoned with salt, seasoned with grace, and that you will receive it, Father, as a sweet-smelling savor. In your Son, Jesus' name, we pray and give thanks. Amen. Amen. Say good morning to everyone. Good morning. We will. Our first selection for our songs will be number 76. 76. How great thou art. Number 76. <clears throat> Seventy-six. <clears throat> Shall we sing? Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, the power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to thee. How great thou art. in the tree when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art Then sings my soul, my Savior, God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come, we shout a acclamation and take me joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim, my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. Then sing my soul, my Savior, God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Number 166. 166. He's my king. One sixty six. Shall we sing? <clears throat> oh, 
day long of Jesus I am singing. He my soul of joy will ever be. All the while he keeps my heart bells ringing. For his love is everything to me. He is my king and oh I dearly love him. He is my king. No other is above him all day long in rapture praise I sing. He, he my savior is my king. Streams of love around my soul are flowing from his heart. Love everlasting spring that it why my faith in him I'm showing that is why and in the song I sing he is my king and oh I dearly love him he is my king no other is above him all day long in rapture praise I sing he my savior is my king in his life, I'm going on to glory with a soul who trusts his saving grace. Going home to sing and tell his story in the blessed sunshine of his faith. He is my king, and oh, I dearly love him. He is my king. No other is above him all day long in rapture praise I sing. He, he my savior, is my king, my blessed king. Good morning again. Brother Bradley has selected the book of John chapter 16, verses 4 through 15 for this morning's scripture reading. John chapter 4, um, I'm sorry, chapter 16, verses 4 through 15. But these things I have told you, that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning, because I was with you. But now I go away to him who sent me, and none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you the things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me, because I go to the Father. Amen. Amen. In First 
Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, the Apostle Paul says that we should pray for everybody, not just a few people or people that we know, but Paul says to pray, pray for kings and all in authority. And he says also to bring your request and your prayers to God with confidence and with an attitude of gratitude or thanksgiving. And that's what we're going to do right now. We're going to pray. I'm going to be taking a knee right here. And if there's anyone who'd like to join me, not necessarily up here, but from your seat. But if the road gets rough while you're on that knee, I want you to come back to your seat. Okay? We don't want any spiritual martyrs in here. Chris, can I have the microphone? So I'd like for you to bow your heads in humble submission as we prepare to pray to, to God. But remember, if you can't take it, come back to your seat. Chris, do I have the microphone? Okay, thank you. Let's pray together. Almighty God, the God of our salvation, the God whose glory is beyond magnificent, the God whose glory is brighter than we can imagine. Our eyes have not seen it, but our hearts believe it. We come to you now, Father, and with our heads bowed, our hearts humbled. And we come to you, Father, through our great high priest and mediator, Jesus Christ, who's made it possible for us to be able to come boldly with confidence to your throne, to make our requests and prayers known. We thank you, Father, for that great gift and sacrifice of your son, Jesus. It's making it possible. We thank you, Father, for all of the blessings that we have received and will receive through Christ Jesus, the inheritance that has been promised, the spiritual gifts and heavenly places that have been promised. We thank you for each and all of them and for those to come. We come on behalf, Father, now in, in prayer for those that are kings and those who are in authority in this land, on this earth. And we ask, Father, that you would tailor and order their thoughts. That you would touch them, Father, in their minds and in their hearts and in their thinking and their thought processes too to be at peace in the world, to end these wars that have been going on, people that have been losing their lives and their loved ones. We just ask, Father, that you would calm the waters, calm the temperatures, bring down the rhetoric. We ask, Father, that you would Bless each of us here as well. We pray, Father, for our brothers and sisters of the Cypress family, those who have been ill as well, who are recovering, who may be in rest homes, at home or in hospitals, who have had surgical procedures. We just pray, Father, that you would touch them with your mighty hand of healing and that you would restore them, Father, especially if that is your will, so that they would be able to once again walk with each of us as they once did. We pray, Father, for the members of this Cypress church and the Cypress family. 
We pray for those who are here, Father, the families that are represented here as well. And we just pray, Father, that you would touch each of us, Father, with your spirit. Help us, Father, to be prepared this morning to worship and praise and give you the honor that is due you. We pray, Father, that you would help us, Father, as your children to work together and to do your will, Father, as we plan this coming year for the different ministries that we have planned and are in focus. Help us, Father, at this church to be able to grow and to mature and to develop and to become a beacon in this community. We ask, Father, that you would forgive us of our sins, of our shortcomings. We're so thankful, Father, that we are able to come to you just as we are. With all of our frailties, our inadequacies. We don't have to get ourselves ready or prepared or dressed up to be able to come to talk to you. We thank you for being available morning, noon, and night. Thank you, Father, for all of your mercy and your grace and your long-suffering and patience that you have shown and you continue to show toward us. Work on us, Father. Help us to have a contrite heart, a repentant heart, a, a sorrowful heart, and so that you can be led inside or to get inside of us and to work on us and work through us so that good things can happen. We thank you so much, Father, for all of your mercy and your grace and the things that you have done for us and that you continue to do. We thank you so much for all of the resources that you have blessed us with as well. It is in the, your son Jesus' name that we pray and give thanks for all of your blessings. Amen. Five hundred and forty three, five forty three. Wonderful words of life. <clears throat> the words that we shall hear today from God's word are wonderful words that talk about the life that our Lord Jesus was willing to give up for us and for the words that God has given us to live by. These are wonderful, wonderful words. 543. <clears throat> Shall we sing? Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the blessed one gives to all wonderful words of life. Send a list to the love and call, wonderful words of life. Oh, all so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, 
wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Oh, offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Sing, the Savior, sanctify forever, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Next song would be Sing and Be Happy, 587. 587. 587. <clears throat> sing and be happy. Shall we sing? If the skies above your gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem gray, all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend, and trust in the promise and friend. Sing and you'll be happy to take breath to long to the tomb. Trust in him who leads the way, he is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong, look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song, and sing and be happy today. Often we are troubled and tired, sick with sorrow and pain. There are others living in sin, blessed with earthly gain. Take your courage, we cannot tell what tomorrow may bring. When the dark light vanishes away, then your heart truly can sing. Sing, you'll be happy today, press along to the door. Trust in him who leads the way, he is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong, look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song, and sing and be happy today. Oh, we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky. When it seems the fortunes of earth frown and pass us by, there are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust in each day, we shall have pleasure untold. Sing and you'll be happy today, press along to the goal. Trust in him who leads the way, he is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong, look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice, praise him in song, and sing and be happy today. Communion song would be number 382, 382, 382, 382, why did my Savior come to earth? Why did he choose? 
Savior's sacrifice on the cross. And in Matthew chapter 26, verse 26, Jesus taught his disciples how to remember him for, of course, the sacrifice that he would be making. A little bit later in that same chapter, around verse 67, Jesus and his disciples had traveled into the Garden of Gethsemane, where he was betrayed and arrested. And he was taken by an angry mob of people before a high priest where he was put on trial. And when he admitted that he was the son of God, that crowd began to abuse him. They spit on him. They hit him. They beat him. They slapped him. And they made fun of him. There were so many people surrounding him that as they hit him and beat him and spit on him when they mocked him. They said, which one of us hit you? Prophesy. But of course, Jesus knew each and every individual who had assaulted him, of course. But they didn't know that. They were having a good time abusing, taking advantage of Jesus at the time. Can you imagine being surrounded by a lot of people who are bent on harming you, hitting you, beating you, spitting on you, making fun of you. 
Jesus endured that and so much more. We know that he ultimately went on to the cross and was crucified. He gave his life for our sins, for the sins of the world. He shed his blood on the cross and he ultimately he died. And so of course that's why we remember him, we pay tribute to him, we honor him for what he has done for us and for humanity. By taking these emblems of the bread and the cup, we remember him and the sacrifice that he made. I'd like to pray now for each emblem, and then you may take your communion. Let's pray together. Our blessed and righteous God, our Father, we come to you at this time thanking you so much for your love and your sacrifice of your Son that you sent to the world to pay the price for our sins. We take this bread, which would represent his broken body. And now, Father, we also come on behalf of the cup which represents the blood that he shed on the cross. We thank you so much for it, Father, and for the purifying effects that it has and the cleansing power that it has on us. In your son Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. Let me take your communion. Nine sixty two. Were you there when they crucified the Lord? Were you there? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Yeah. 
for us to give back to the Lord. In Mark chapter 12, I believe it's around verses 41 through 44, there is the account of the poor widow's sacrifice who gave of her livelihood. She, she gave all that she had, and I think it was only about two or three cents that she had. There was everything. She put it into the treasury. Jesus watched or saw her do that. And he also saw other people pass by who gave out of their abundance of wealth, plenty of money. They wouldn't have missed what they put in. But he saw this poor widow, and he taught his disciples about what she had done, how she had given more than all of the money that they had put into the treasury combined that day. Just a powerful example of giving, of sacrificial giving as well. Let's go to God together in prayer at this time. Almighty God, again we come to you with our heads bowed, our hearts humbled, our minds centered and focused on you and what you have done for us, and what you continue to do, the blessings that we receive on a daily basis, the resources that you have blessed many of us to be able to have and to be stewards over. And at this time, Father, we're going to Take up an offering at this time. We just pray that what is collected will be used for the benefit of your kingdom. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Standing on the promises, uh, 452, um, God has made promises to us in, in our daily living and our giving, 452, standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises. Standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing on the promises. Just standing on the promises. I am standing on the promises of God. Let us sing number uh, 850, 851, 851. Please stand. Let's all stand, please. Okay. 
think this is one of Brother Bradley's favorites. So, uh, <laughs> I believe it is. And we're going to. I'll fly away. Let us sing joyfully to the Lord. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly, fly away, fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly, fly away. Someday I'll fly, fly away. Good morning, everybody. So good to be in the house of the Lord. You all right, Brother Merkerson? Are you okay? Okay. All right. So good to be in the house of the Lord. Glad to see you all. So glad you all can see me, and I know that you're looking at me. <laughs> uh, we're blessed uh, to be able to come into uh, this worship place today. And thankful to God for his blessings in life each and every day that we are able to be here. And we are encouraged by the work that God continues to do with us and through us here at the Cypress Church. We're welcoming those who are in our virtual audience and we're welcoming those of you who are in our room today. Y'all got your Bibles? Okay. <laughs> I like that enthusiasm. Yes, we have our Bibles because we need our Bibles. The Bible is the foundation for our understanding and for the teaching of God's word. As we often say in our fellowship here that we are Bible believing church. And that being said and true, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, correction, instruction and in righteousness that the men of God may be thoroughly equipped unto every good work. And so as we have that in mind, I want you to turn to the Gospel of John in your Bible. Now, I know that we are, our theme is that we live, we are living in, at Cyprus, we live to the glory of God in uh, everything and all that we do, of course. 
Uh, but that's our theme for this year, and we want to, to continue to keep that in front of you. And we've been talking about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is a vital part of the work of the Lord in the world, especially through the church. We'll be talking about that uh, in our message today. And so we've, talk, we've been talking about gifts of the Spirit and how the Spirit utilizes the church to be his arm, the arm, the legs, the mind of the Lord himself. And so we have to continue to focus on what God is doing um, to encourage us in his work. Y'all with me? Yeah. Okay. Now, I'm taking a step back today. Just, one, just a half, maybe a half step back. Because as we talk about Romans chapter uh, 12 last week, we were talking about the manifestation of the Spirit through the church. And that the gifts provided to the church are for the church. Today we're taking a step back to look at um, the Holy Spirit himself as Jesus began to uh, prepare for his coming. And we'll find that in John chapter 16. It's, it's, it starts in John chapter 13 because it's the upper room discourse. But I'm going to read John 16 as we, we read, or was read for us this morning. John 16, and we're gonna read verses four through 15 um, to kind of lay the groundwork for the message today. And the message, the topic that I want to use for today uh, is the work of the Spirit um, to the glory of God. The work of the Spirit to the glory of God. And hopefully we'll be able to bring that out as we develop this thought. So if you, if you, if you have your Bibles, we're going to read the, just a portion of this message just before Jesus begins to depart. He's talking to his disciples and they're in the upper room in this discourse. And what he's doing is he's preparing them. He's, he's prepping them for what's going to come as disciples. And it's pretty sobering if you think about our relationship to the Lord as disciples. If we are disciples, then there are certain you know, things that come with, be, with being a disciple. Uh, that we hopefully that can, let me just read this for us so we can get through this. Uh, verse four, I'm reading from the Revised Standard Version. He tells his disciples, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. So there's certain things that the Lord is revealing to them in the upper room discourse that he had not revealed to them, you know, because he was in their midst, which means that while he's teaching, he's taking the heat for a lot of the stuff that's happening. And what's happening is Jesus is initiating, he's bringing in tremendous change in the religious world around him. And when you, when you talk to people and engage people religiously uh, in their foundation, you are looking for a fight. That's just the bottom line. And, and this was among his own people. And so he says, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. Yet none of you asked me, where are you going? And of course, they have asked him where he's going. But just in this particular instance, Jesus reminds them again of the idea of where he is going. Verse six, but because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. He's leaving, so they're saddened by it. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. So now it's going to be profitable that I go away because for if I do not go away, and my text says the counselor, other texts say the comforter, 
or the helper. And that, that those translations vary because the, the, the meaning of that word is not solidified. Parakle, parakaleo, parakaleo. Means someone who comes alongside to, to help. He's your helper. He comes along so he can counsel, he can guide, he's doing things. But he's, he's with you. So the counselor, if I don't go, Jesus tells them, the counselor won't come. And this is all tied into God's ministry in the world. But if I go, he says, I will send. If I, if I go, I'll send him to you. And when he comes, he will convince the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment concerning sin because they do not believe in me concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no more concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged and then we, we read the, 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 uh, the next paragraph Jesus that's about Jesus' departure now here's what the, the, the spirit will do verse 12 I have yet many things to say to you but you cannot bear them now I think about that a lot you know you know the, the, Paul says God won't put on you more than you can bear some things everybody's just not ready for. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a concept of the of God that every child of God is not ready for everything that the Spirit will bring. But anyway, and Jesus is talking to them. But you you're not ready yet. Anyway, he's prepping them. Preparation thirteen. When the Spirit of Truth comes, and I like this I this the, the phrase the Spirit of Truth. And I'll just connect it. You know, when Jesus says it, you know what Jesus says in, in uh, John 14? I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus says, I am truth. And then in this text, he says, he is the spirit of truth. So you have the work of Jesus as truth and the spirit of truth. So when the spirit of truth comes, which means he's going to be representing God, he will guide. He has, he has a function. He will guide you into all the truth. And I just like that. You know, there's not more than one truth to anything. There's only one truth. Okay, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> For he will not speak on his own authority. This is another interesting one. He won't speak on his own authority. He's not going to go in. He's not going to go beyond what's been given to him. But whatever he hears, he'll speak. He's not going to go beyond what I've already said or done. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. So there's some foretelling. He's going to let you know what's, what's going to happen in the future. For 14, he will glorify me. There's our word, you are glorified. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father is, all that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And so just for a few minutes, the work of the Spirit to the glory of God. The night, the night of the Last Supper. And just for your contextual information, this is an upper room discourse. He's in the, remember, he's up in, in the upper room with the disciples. And they're there for the Last, for the last Supper. The and to put this in John's context, your, understand that this discourse started in John's Gospel in chapter 13 and it will end in chapter 17 
when Jesus finishes his prayer. So this conversation is pretty lengthy conversation as Jesus is preparing the disciples for his departure. And we, we of course, know how that's going to happen, but we'll talk about that. And so in the, the, on the night of this Last Supper, Jesus discussed with his disciples the events that would happen after his departure from the world. The disciples will be exposed to rejection. Our text says hatred that Jesus faced in disclosing the truth of eternal life that he offered as the son of God. It's pretty interesting how, thing, how tense things can get when you're offering people something <laughs> worthwhile. But and I want to keep on using that idea of, it, of tense because um, what Jesus is describing is pretty intense. The hatred, the hatred of the world was real, especially for followers of Christ. Hatred. If I go back to chapter six, uh, verse number one, if we go back to verse number one, the text says, uh, 16, Jesus says, I have said all this to you to keep you from falling away. I need to, I need to shore you up. And he needs to shore them up because the pressure is great. The challenges are great. Meeting the world is not an easy task, especially when you are taking the gospel to them. Right. Stay with me. I think that's why a lot of people shy away from it. Verse two, this is what Jesus says. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed. The hour or the time is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. We're taking you out in the name of God. You remember Saul? Paul, you remember? Persecutor of the church. Put to death Christians. Drag them out of their homes. You remember him? It was real. And, he, and, 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 and what did he do? It He did it in the name of God. Right? So it's not far-fetched, but a reality, especially in the life of disciples. Verse 3, and they will do this because they have not. This is why. This is why. It's, it's blatant. They have not known the Father, nor have they known me. So these are people of faith, but, or whether want to proclaim faith, but they really don't know God. Like they think they know God. This is where we have to be careful. Verse 4. But I have said these things to you. I have said these things to you that when the hour comes, you may remember that I told you what was going to happen. So they face expulsion from their worship places, from the synagogue. They face death at the hands of religious people um, who believed that they were doing a service of God by taking them out. Uh, uh, and this, of course, all was the consequence of ignorance and unbelief. This is what ignorance and unbelief will do. People begin to move and act on, you know, what they've got formed in their minds. And, and this is what the world, the text, will do. Because as Jesus says, they have not known the Father nor me. The Lord's departure was inevitable and necessary for the progress of his mission. The disciples uh, needed the strength of faith to continue in their calling for Christ 
as he would soon depart. Jesus promised them once, and he promised them again here, that he will send the Holy Spirit to guide in the work he called them to do in the world. That is, to go make disciples, baptizing and teaching them to do all that the Lord had commanded them to do. The strength needed to do this work will be effected only by direct influence of the Holy Spirit. You and I cannot do this work on our own or alone. The Holy Spirit's role in this work will be in three areas, according to John. In 16 verses 8 through 11, it will be in the area of his mission to the world, number one. The second area will be, as we read in 16, 12, and 13, his message through the church. And the third area would be his ministry for Christ in verses 16, 14, 15. Jesus describes the work of the Spirit as that of or like that of a prosecutor presenting a case in the court room of God's justice. The spirit will convict the world because of sin, because of righteousness, and because of judgment. He will guide the church in the message of the truth, 16, 13, 12, 13, and he will glorify, 16, 14, and 15, the work of Christ to the glory of God. In other words, he's going to spotlight it. He's going to highlight it. He's going to, he's going to, to make a beeline, beeline focus on what Christ has done as his work to glorify God. It's not going to be about him per se although he has a great influence in the work of the church, as he, we will see as he works through the apostles. But his goal is not about himself as much as it is about the glory of God. And so it is that we live to the glory of God. And we have to understand that in order to do that, you know, a lot has to go behind us in order for us to put God first and before us in the mission of God in the world. And so I want to just talk briefly for, about those three things. Oh, if I may, I might just get through one of them. But it, that is the mission of God to the world. The Spirit's mission in the world is to convict. Y'all know what that means? Like a prosecutor in a criminal courtroom. <laughs> the Spirit will convict the unbelieving world because of their denial of Jesus as the Son of God, or for their denial. And he will convict them, the text says, concerning sin. He will prosecute the world because of the sin of unbelief. And of course, as we define belief, belief is that we accept something to be true or false. But in rejecting Jesus, it means that we do not accept it to be true that he is the son of God. So if we do not accept it to be true that he is the son of God, then we reject who he is. But not only do we reject who he is, we reject all that he stands for. Unbelief is described. Oh, this thing here, I'm telling you, this, this, this thing is driving me crazy. It wants to talk when I'm talking. Unbelief is described as darkness in the world. Go with me, if you will, to John chapter 3. John 3, verse 16. I'll start at 16. I like to read from my text. And so we know John 3.16, 3, 
For God so loved the world. Y'all know that one? That he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 17, here. For God sent the Son into what? The world. Not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Um, Verse 18, he who believes in him is not condemned. And of course, condemned, damned, you know, to, off into eternal punishment. If you believe in him, and this is, this is the, surf, the, the, the message of John's gospel. He says, he who does not believe, but rather he who does not believe is condemned already. Because, why, he has not believed in what? In the name of the only Son of God. And so you've got this unbelief going on about Jesus who presents himself and represents God in the way that God sent him to represent. But he's rejected and dejected by those who hear and see him. And in that rejection, it stands out as unbelief. Verse 19. And this is the judgment that the light, listen, the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light. Tell me that's not real today. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. You know, so when you make up your mind, what you, you make up in your mind what you want to be about and what you want to do, it doesn't matter how much light comes into the room, you will still see it the way you want to see it. The truth can be told and you'll call it a lie. A lie can be told and you will call it the truth. This is the darkness of the world. Don't be surprised by it. But it's real. And so we hear Jesus talking about that. Where everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. We don't want people to really know who we are. We want to continue in a cloaked manner so that we can look like or so that we can in our minds make up that we do stand for God on some level. But really it's not about God. It's about our own righteousness. And we can do some wicked things in his name. Even though it's about our own righteousness and not his. Stay with me church. For God sent into the world not to condemn. He didn't come to condemn. He says, but just as uh, his deeds should be, uh, rather, his deeds should be exposed. 21, but he who does what is true comes to the light. And it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been wrought in God. And so this judgment, or rather, despite the fact that truth and light have come into the world, darkness prevails in the lives of some. The world continues in darkness because it rejects truth and light. So I want to take you to 1 John. 1 John 1. I want to just establish this with you so you can appreciate uh, the foundation and the idea of why the Spirit comes to convict or to, con to convict the world of sin because of unbelief. So when we don't believe, we live as we choose and we allow darkness to consume our lives. 
So if we turn to 1 John, if I can find 1 John in my Bible. Y'all got 1 John in your Bible? We find 1 John chapter 1, and we read 1 John 1. Listen to the text. And remember the idea, the point is that the world continues in darkness because it rejects truth and light. And this is what John says in 1 John. This is the message we have heard from him who, and proclaim to you that God is what? God is light. 1 John 1 verse 5. Sorry. God is what? God is light. Okay. Not only is God light, but God is truth because the Bible tells us that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the light. This, then Jesus called the spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, right? Yes. And so God is light. And in him, there is no darkness at all. So it's all, it's all open with, with, as far as God is concerned. Verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him, if I have communion with God, and, and I walk in darkness, listen, and I walk in darkness, what is that? But a lie, right? It's a lie. We lie. And do not live how? According to truth. If I say I have, so if I claim to be a believer and I don't accept him as my Lord and follow the teaching of his faith in that way, then you know, I'm, I may be inclined to be considered walking in darkness. And to walk in darkness means that I don't walk in the truth. And so darkness means that I don't walk in the light, but I can't say I have fellowship with God and walk in darkness. Because in him, there is no darkness. Y'all with me? So he says, we lie and we do not according to the truth. Verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship not only with him, but we have fellowship with whom? With one another. Yes. Yes. I have fellowship with you and you have fellowship with me, right? We walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And so we walk in fellowship based on what Christ has done in the saving of our souls. I am your brother and you are my sister in the Lord. As we have been cleansed and embraced the same teaching of salvation that has come in Christ. And, we, and we, we live and we walk in the light with God. So we have fellowship with God based on what Christ has done. And we have fellowship with one another based on what Christ has done. And we do not walk in darkness. But we walk in the light. The world is dark. And I want to kind of hang that out there. Because I need to say, I'm going to just interlude here. I need to say that, you know, if you, if you align yourself with the darkness of the world, but you didn't claim that, you, that your darkness is the righteousness of God, there's something corrupt about that. There's something very corrupt about that. And you can fool me, but you can't fool God. Darkness is darkness. And walking in it, you will bump into a few things if you don't know where you're going. Okay, well, let me not spend time. Let me get through this. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us. So it's an ongoing cleansing. I accepted him. It's an ongoing cleansing. I have him forever in, in, my, in my life as I walk by faith. Verse 8. If we say we have no sin. Now he brings it home a little closer. If we say, so he aligns sin with lying. He aligns sin with darkness and walking in dark. He aligns sin with, with not having fellowship with God. If we say we have no sin, he aligns sin with not being cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Another sinful life. 
But the blood of Jesus does cleanse us from sin if we put our faith and believe in him. And so he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. You know, the worst person that you can deceive is yourself. You know, it just don't make no sense. <laughs> but people do it. Ain't no question about it. We deceive ourselves. And what? The truth is not in us. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, here is, here's, my, here's my spiritual responsibility to continue to walk in the light and the fellowship of God. And what is that? To confess our sins. Why? Because he's faithful. And what? And just to do what? To forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Unbelief is denial of God and Christ. Those who deny truth have no light of God within them. Those who twist truth do not live according to truth. Jesus says, uh, in, in one context, and he t talks about, he's talking to uh, the, J the Jewish people in John 8. It's a very intense conversation as Jesus has it with um, those Jewish unbelievers who didn't want to accept him for who he was, you know, and the question of true, the true children of Abraham. And at the top of the conversation, Jesus says to his disciples, if you continue in my word, which here we just learned in John that, you know, if we, if we, um, his word is not in us. If we say that we don't have sin and, and, and we lie, his word is not in us. And, and, and there's a reason for that, because it's true. The word of God brings us to where God needs us to be if we accept his word to be true. And so Jesus says in John 8, 31, in conversation, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. And you will know the truth. Now, and the truth will do what? It will make you free. How do you know the truth? Well, it has something to do with your own integrity. It absolutely has something to do with your integrity. For God is looking for such to worship him in spirit and in truth. To thine own self be true. Don't deceive yourself. That's the idea. Are you with me? And, you know, we can allow, we can allow outside things to come in, into the picture so that we can lean on those things to continue to reject and deny God's truth. But that's not going to get you past God's truth. That is the smell test, if you will. And so, you know, they talked about, they answered Jesus in that we're the sins of Abraham and, and have never been a, a bondage to anyone. In other words, we're already free. You know, a liar will tell you, I, 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 let, me, let me focus. So if we drop down into the text, you know, the debate about Abraham and the father and all that. But if we drop down um, to verse number 43, I'll pick it up there. Jesus had already, he said to them, I didn't come of my own will, didn't come of my own accord, but I came with, with, with God's message in mind. And he said in verse 43, why do you not understand what I'm saying? Why do you not understand the truth when you hear it? Yeah. 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 You, you find Jesus, this probe, this probe isn't about Jesus. Unbelief isn't about Jesus. Unbelief is about you. It's about you. Don't try to point a finger at Jesus and call him wrong or not of God, which, you know, 
I'm not saying, you know, you can't question or you can't stand back and say, hmm, well, now let me see. I have a question about this. Can I ask? Even the disciples ask questions and Jesus answered them. But there's some place in your mind where you have to determine and decide that there is something right about this that I, in, you know, I, I, I just can't accept because I choose to deny it. Why do you not understand what I am saying? That's what he says in 43. Go, he goes on. It is because, listen, listen. It is because, Jesus tells him why. You cannot bear to hear my word. Now he's not talking to just any old group. He's talking to religious folk. He's talking to people that already have some idea of God and religion planted in their head. Don't you think you can't reject God just because you are religious? We can and we do. And so he says, you are, it's because you cannot bear to hear my word. Why can't we bear, to, why can't you bear to hear my word? Because, and this, this gets, you know, this is what Je- you know, Jesus gets to be pretty biting, man. This is some in your face stuff. You are of your father, the devil. Who wants to hear that? You are of your father, the devil. And what? And your will the, 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 your decision, your, your volition, your aim, your purpose, your will is to do your father's desires. So you've already got it made up in your mind what you're going to do. I don't care who put it there. When you know it needs to change. Because truth is staring you down. And you say, no, this ain't truth. It ain't about truth. It's about you. This is what the spirit has come to do. He's come to convict. Jesus goes on. I got to get this out of here. Man, he he was a murderer from the beginning, you know, in the garden of Eden. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with truth. Some people don't want anything to do with the truth. That's just the reality. And, and it's because they fix their mind and, 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 and they've said it to, to, on one thing, because it has nothing to do with the truth, because there is no truth in him. So that father, he, there's no truth in, in, in the dust. There's, in other words, there's no truth in him. There's no light in him. There is nothing but darkness in him. He says, next phrase, when he lies, he speaks according to his own nature. And he is what? He's a liar and the father of lies. Listen, verse 45, verse 45. But because I tell you the truth. And this, is what, this is what happens when you walk in dark. You know, when you finally hear the truth, Jesus says, because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not my fault. Right, right. You don't believe me. Verse 46. Which of you, and so he flips it around, which of you convicts me of sin? You know, the Holy Spirit, it's kind of a little irony, from what I can see, a little irony, you know, the spirit, of, the spirit of God comes to convict the world of sin. Yet the world takes Jesus' truth, flips it on his head, turns it back at him and says, oh no, we don't believe you, you're not of God, you don't belong to, you don't belong to anything God. Is. And Jesus says, well, which of you convict me of sin? You are the conviction of sin? You are not the standard for righteousness. I, if I tell you the truth, why? There's our question. Why don't you understand? Why do you not believe me? Ask yourself that question. Why don't you believe Jesus? 
And I'll tell you, there'll be about as many answers as there are people. And none of them will matter when the Lord stands to judge. And, and I'll just get it for you. John 12. Let's go get the, go get the, the, the judge. John 12. John 12, um, 44. I'll start there. None of it will matter. Um, because Jesus says in John 44, Jesus cried out and said, John 12, 44, he who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. 45. And he, and he who sees me sees him who sent me. 46. I've come as light. There he is. I've come as light. You're so encumbered with darkness, you don't even know light when you see it. Sort of like the black hole thing out there and, you know, way out there in billions of light years away. You know, the, the center of our you know, the black hole, that hole where nothing can come through. A lot of people got that going on in their mind. Black holes of unbelief. And he says to them, he who sees me sees him who sent me. He says, I have come as light into the world that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Remember, we just talked about truth a minute ago. Verse 47, if anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. 48. He who rejects me and does not re receive me, my sayings, has a judge. The word that I have spoken will be his judge on the last day. So now, you know, it, it, it's not even a crapshoot. It's not a crapshoot. <laughs> you know, heaven and earth will pass, but my word shall stand forever. You can rest assured that God's word will meet you in the judgment. When he meets you there, what will your place of belief be? That I knew, but I just didn't go? <laughs> okay, I, I can't, I, I don't want to play, that, play with that right now. Anyone who does not have Jesus, there is no advocacy on their behalf to plead for them before God in the judgment. Okay, so if we go back to the courtroom scenario, you've got, you know, the spirit who's come to convict. He's the prosecutor, and he's convicting the world of sin, and the world of sin because of unbelief, and the darkness that we allow to consume us. And as that darkness consumes us, we can't hear nothing, we can't see nothing, and we ain't doing nothing for God. Although we deceive ourselves and make ourselves believe that we are. Because it sounds good, and it looks good, and it feels good in some places. But it's really not what God is expecting of us because we're just going through the motions, you know, with the traditions, you know, with the, with the, with the, with the routines, with all the things that we're used to doing. You know, we're not really getting out of our box. And Jesus kind of preps the disciples for that and he says to them, listen, you know, I couldn't give you everything because you ain't ready for everything. But just know that when you really get down to business, they'll kick you out of church. Not only will they kick you out of church, they'll take your life and they'll tell you that they're doing it in the name of God. Are you ready for this? Are you really ready for this? Are you really ready to bring glory to God in your life? You know, that means, you know, whatever baggage you have, you got to let it go. Don't let some little issue become your stumbling block. You got bigger fish to fry. Amen. We get hung up on the trivial and we lose perspective of the mass. You know, when you look out there in the end of space and you look back at the earth, you know, we're not big. We're not as big as even one of those little light bulbs up there. And you're tri stumbling over this little truth? Stay with me, church. Y'all with me? So, 
The Holy Spirit's prosecution of sin is to convict the unbelieving world who remain in darkness because they deny the truth about Jesus who is the Son of God. And to just put a bow on that, I, I was reading, I think it was Tenny, I was reading, the cross was the condemnation of all that the world contained. Its pride, its envy, its hatred, rebellion, and its unbelief in Jesus. The function of the Spirit is to apply that condemnation to the world and make it conscious of the reality of judgment. So we have to know that when we step up to step out in the name of God that, you know, the Holy Spirit has come to convict sin. But not only, not only because of sin, but also because of righteousness. Now, what do you mean? What do you mean because of righteousness? In that next phrase, and I probably won't only get through this one verse. I won't get to the other two, but, you know, because concerning righteousness. Why? Because I go to the Father. Well, what do you mean, Jesus? Well, the sadness came over, over you know, the disciples were saddened by the fact that the Lord was going to leave. And he told them, listen, if I don't go, then the work is not going to be done. And so um, um, the sadness that overcame them is that the Lord had to leave them, but his departure would mean the coming of the Holy Spirit. All right. Y'all, y'all see how I took a step back. We're, we're kind of out, out in front of this. You know, in the church, the Holy Spirit's already got here. We're talking about where the disciples were at the time. So the coming of the Spirit. Only his going away would allow the Spirit to come. And so because the Spirit will not come if Jesus does not go away, and that going away was not going to be just a vacation, but he was going to go to the cross. He was journeying to the cross. As much as the world wanted to ridicule, anyway, on the way to the cross, if Jesus does not go away through death to die for the sins of the world, the Holy Spirit will not come. And so God remains. He is and he remains the only standard for righteousness and judgment in this world. So, those very same people that, who, who want to accept the lie for the truth and the truth for the lie are the people that put him on the cross because they couldn't see the righteousness in him. So they pushed him to the cross, flogged him on the way to the cross, hung him on the cross, took him down from the cross, stuck him in a grave, and then God did the rest. You see what sin does? Sin will take Jesus and his disciples and throw them away like they mean nothing to them because, you know, that's really not my purview. That's not what I see. That's not what I believe. That's not where my heart is. I live in darkness in this world. It's consumed me and it has me and it's got me. And, you know, and so they, they put him on the cross. But God decided that in his righteousness he would remain there. He declared that he would be just in his, it, it, rather, he would be just in, that's capital J-U-S-T, just in his condemnation of sin, which means that God is not going to allow sin to go unpunished. Sin will not go unpunished. It has to be punished because of God's holiness. But in being just in the punishment of the sin of the world, God himself became the justifier. In other, in other words, he subjected himself to the punishment yeah. Yeah. to protect you and me. To protect the world so that the world might be saved. And so he's the justifier to take the penalty of death upon himself. And this is the convincing proof. So remember, we're talking about he's going to convict the world because of sin. He's going to convict the world because of righteousness. Well, what righteousness? The proof. Because Jesus is going to go away. 
He didn't stay in the grave. God raised him from the grave. If there's anything called vindication, this is it. This is it. You convict a man, you kill a man according to your laws and your standards to make him subject to you. Whatever darkness is going on inside of you, you cast him aside and you bury him in a grave. But God says, hold up, wait a minute. You're not the standard for righteousness. I am. Get up from there. God tells him to get up and he gets up out of the grave. And as he gets up out of the grave, he goes on. But the price for sin has been paid. So, you know, in our evil, we put him down. But, you know, when we finally decide to turn around and come to him, he's still there waiting for us to deliver us. Are you all with me? Yes. And so, you know, that idea of bringing glory to God, you know, that's part of it. But just to know that he, not only is Jesus up from the grave, but he's exalted and he's sitting at the right hand of God. This is ultimate vindication and acquittal. God has overturned the world's conviction and lifted him to the throne to be the judge himself. Righteousness will overcome in the end always. The Lord denied because of it. Peter illustrated the principle on Pentecost when he said, Jesus of Nazareth was a man approved of God. That he was executed by the hand of lawless men. But God raised him up so that being therefore by the right hand of God, exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth that which you now see and hear. He's alive, church. And he lives forevermore. And, you know, even though we may have tried to put him to death because of sin, and we still do because of sin, he lives forevermore. Y'all with me? So concerning righteousness, God has turned it around. Why? Because he's righteous. And why is he righteous? Because of the power of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. To everyone believes, who believes, to the Jew and the Gentile. For this is the righteousness of God that's displayed from faith to faith. God's righteousness is on display. Romans 3, Romans, uh, Romans uh, chapter 3, verse number 21 and following. Um, so God has put it all out there. Romans 1, 16. And so we need to understand that God is in control. Now, the last thing that I'm going to say today. I don't know what time it is. I threw my watch away, didn't I? Oh, yeah, it's time. I'll just say this about concerning judgment. Because the ruler of this world has been judged. Okay, so, so if you line your life up with the devil, guess what? <laughs> you will go the way the devil went. You know, you'll, you'll go the way the devil went. You know, some people have trouble with hell, and I've had trouble, you know, processing the idea of hell. But, you know, that's where the devil comes from. Or rather, that's where God has placed him. In hell. But if, 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 if the devil is my father, if the God of this world is my father, and I align my thinking and my decisions and my choices with the father or the ruler of this world, and the Holy Spirit comes into the world, to shine a light on the world, to tell the world what truth and light is, and, 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 and exposes all the darkness that comes from the devil, and I still align with the devil, then guess what? I only deserve to go where the devil is and where the devil is going. And the reason is because I've made that choice. And, and that's, the, that's the, one recon, the one reconciling idea that I, can, that I have as it relates to God. You know, you've got to give it all to him in, in your living, his your life of glory. Give it all to him or, 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 or don't give it, don't, don't come half-stepping. You know, there ain't nothing like a lukewarm person or a lukewarm church. You know, and then in Revelation, the Bible says, you know, for the lukewarm people, the Lord will spill you out. Why? Because, you know, it doesn't taste good to have lukewarm stuff floating around. Are you lukewarm? Do 
do you need a fire? Stay away from the devil. <laughs> He'll give you one. <laughs> Are you lukewarm? You need the Lord in your life. Let me get out. Concerning judgment. Judgment not only concerns Satan, but those who love darkness rather than the light because of their evil deeds. So now, I, I wanted to frame that, the work of the Spirit to the glory of God. And I, we, we needed to talk about the message of the church and then talk about what the Spirit's going to do. The Spirit is only going to say what God tells him to say. And so he says, hear the word of God. Believe it with all your heart. Repent of your sins. Repent. Repent, turn, change, come to the Lord. Confess him, the son of God. Acknowledge him. Acknowledge him that he, acknowledge that he is the son of God. In your heart, in your mind. Make up your mind. And then to take the steps to follow him. Follow him where? Follow him to the grave. How? Through baptism. How? Because it's an act of mercy. We're baptized into Christ. By faith, we're baptized. And then we're raised up to walk in the newness of life. Grace has abounded all the more, Romans 5. Grace has overcome and over, uh, taken over all the, the sins of the world. All you got to do is accept that Jesus has done it for you. And when you do, make the choice to follow him all the way. Go to the, go to the grave. Die with him. And that's done through baptism in water for the remission of our sins. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized. What? Every one of you. For what? For the remission of your sins. And what? And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit himself. Do you want the Lord in your life today? Make up your mind. If you, if you have the Lord and you need the Lord in your life today, give him your heart. Tell him what your concerns are, what your needs are. Express them inside and out. And let him... Be the one to lead you to the glory of God in all that you do. We're going to stand and sing a song of encouragement. We, we invite you and encourage you to come at this time as we stand and sing. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me hold again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other power I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin Nothing but the blood of Jesus, not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white. Did you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, yes, good morning, church. I'm just in pain right now, but I just want to uh, say this was my stop to come here today. Yes. I didn't care if I had to crawl, but I wanted to come <laughs> and be with God. So uh, I had a procedure done on my shoulder, and uh, I, I'm under cortisone drugs and stuff. So. Okay. I just wanted to tell the church to pray for me. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Glad you could be here. Glad you came. All righty. Is there any other prayer requests that we have today? I have one in my hand um, to, for us from, to, I need to remember, yes, I wanted to be asking the church to continue to pray for Brother A.C. Hamilton. Uh, I had a chance to talk with him a few days, about a week ago. And uh, he's coming through some things, and 
we want to, to continue to pray for him and pray with him. And not only him, but pray for all those who are in need. I uh, need the Lord in their life. Any other prayer requests that we have today? All righty then. Chat. Okay, shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, eternal God, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit of God who is our comforter, our protector, our provider, the one who we enjoy uh, our salvation, the hope of our salvation. Um, we thank you for all that you do and have done. We thank you for your love, your grace, truth, your word, all that's related to the life that we lead in Christ Jesus. And we pray, Father, for your blessings to continue to be bestowed here at Cyprus in our fellowship. We thank you for all those who are in attendance today and for their participation and engagement in, uh, in, in worship this morning in this service. And we pray, Father, that you'll continue to shine a light on us and help continue to give us hope, to give us to give a, continue to give us opportunity to do your will. Thank you for every blessing that is ours because of your power and your work in and among us. May your grace be with those who are sick and unable to be about as they have been. May your grace be with those who are struggling spiritually or emotionally. May your grace be with those who are at home and uh, recovering from some kind of illness or sickness that are among our fellowship. Your grace be with all those who need to know you and to need you and need you in their lives at this time. May you continue to be a light for us, a beacon of hope and a balm in uh, our situations. Provide those comforts that we need. Bless us in our efforts as a church family. Bless us in our effort in uh, this part of your kingdom. Help us to continue to move forward and to do your will and to overcome any obstacles that may beset us. Allow the power of your word to have its place in our hearts, to change our minds and to bring us in alignment with your will. Help us to grow in love and grace and peace and truth and righteousness and to continue in being a beacon of hope and light in this community. Thank you, Father, for every good and perfect gift that is ours that comes from above. Keep us in your grace and in your care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We have been encouraged, enlightened, and strengthened at the hearing of God's word this morning. Amen. Amen. Thank Brother Bradley for sharing it with us this morning. I don't think I have seen any visitors in the auditorium. If so, please let us know if you're here. I don't think we have any. We're all homegrown, home folk here. All right. I just have a couple of brief announcements then. We will be having our closing song and benediction. We have been announcing the last couple of weeks that we have uh, out at the foyer there on the table sign-up sheets for signing up for various committees. So if you haven't done so, you want to do that. And also today, following the worship this morning, we're going to have a, a meeting that uh, will be put on during the Bible class hour regarding those uh, persons and or committees that we um, have been talking about. So you want to stay for that. It's for all members to participate in. And then finally, uh, please keep in mind that uh, the um, Pepperdine is having their annual lectureship. It's beginning uh, this, later this month on the 30th. So for further details, please check the bulletin if you plan to uh, attend or take advantage of the uh, lectureship. If there's nothing else, any other announcements? I'm going to have Brother Webb lead us in a closing song, and then I'll come back and give the benediction. 755. Let's all stand. God be with you to be me. Again, by his counsel, God uphold you with his sheep securely for you. God be with you to we me again. To
Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, again, we thank you so much for your love and your mercy and your grace. We thank you for blessing us to be able to come and to worship you this morning. We thank you for the word that has been shared with us, and we just pray, Father, that we will take it to heart and it will change our lives and help us to do more for you and your kingdom. Protect us, Father, as we prepare to leave this place. Any refreshments that are um, in the fellowship hall, we ask that you will bless them and we receive them with thanksgiving as well. In your son's name we pray, amen.